It's the My Michelle Live podcast. Looking for the God story and news of the day. My Michelle Live news and views. Here's Michelle. New Year's edition of My Michelle Live. And on this news and views Thursday, New Year's. What is it about? What is our fascination with New Year's, right? Should old acquaintance be forgotten and never brought to mind? How do you celebrate New Year's and what's our fascination? We're going to take it on from our side of the world, but we're also going to be looking at it with a view from Jerusalem. And now a view from Jerusalem with Rabbi Adlerstein. Our beloved Rabbi, thank you for joining us and happy almost New Year's. Same to you. I wish we had a couple of glasses of eggnog we could kind of drink together, but We'll make the best of things. I make eggnog every single year, a homemade recipe. Uh, it's just tradition for us. But there, you know, there are a lot of traditions. There are also a lot of differing times that people celebrate New Year's, of course. Uh, you celebrated it months ago, uh, and we're just days away. Uh, there are traditions in every society. So I thought we'd talk about some. I'd, I'd offer a few family traditions. I miss, mentioned my family being from the South. So black-eyed peas was always served at our New Year's Day dinner. Ham and black-eyed peas, which is uh, something that I wouldn't recommend. But <laughs> you had to have a black-eyed pea, at least one or two, so you could have good luck. A Mexican tradition. Uh, kind of a strange one is uh, the toasting of grapes. So you have 12 grapes representing the 12 months of the year. And uh, for some, it's a matter of who whoever gets those grapes down the fastest and they will be in your glass of whatever you're drinking uh, will have the best luck I guess if you manage to eat them and not choke them down and die from <laughs> not being able to breathe from grapes in your mouth um, being part Hawaiian uh, pounding mochi or going for a a walk uh, the the first walk of the year are are interesting traditions another mexican tradition which i find very strange is if you wear a certain kind of underwear colored underwear you'll have a certain kind of luck for the new year so those are some that i've been acquainted with in my lifetime how about you rabbi well uh, new year's uh, to us comes out in the in the fall in the hebrew month of tishrei and it marks the anniversary of the the creation of man, and according to the uh, story in Genesis of the the first sin of Adam of Adam and Eve and their recovery from it, so it becomes a time of of repentance, of God revisiting the world once a year and saying, well. Uh, should we give it another year? Uh, how how is this world doing? And all the ingredients and all the parts, and it's you know it's a it's a serious time of year. Well, if God is looking <laughs> at 2020 and 2021, and He's still letting us continue into 2022, that is a testament to His forbearance, to His grace, <laughs> to His patience. I would say. And and. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not a trivial matter. I, I I think that religious people have a different view of what it means to turn a new leaf, of what the passage of time can mean, of of how time is experienced, and that's really what we're doing here together. I don't I don't expect any any of our listeners here to. Um, rush to a synagogue Friday night and uh, blow the shofar, the ram's horn, like we do on, on our uh, first day of, of, of the year in, uh, in, in, in September. But I think that what we do share is a different outlook on what the passage of time means. How Frank, 
important to look at that because it's it's not so much the day. Uh, if I'm correct, the earliest recorded New Year celebrations uh, were thought to be in Mesopotamia, and they occurred during the vernal equinox in mid March. Um, it is said that an astronomer convinced Julius Caesar to follow the solar year instead from uh, BC 46, and the new year would begin in January. And some of those New Year celebrations, they all had some kind of religious uh, connection, celebrating the God, celebrating or uh, making pledges to a God. But there is something very potent, I would say, regardless of when you celebrate it, how you celebrate it, your traditions, there is something very potent about <coughs> looking back, what looking back means, and what it means to move forward. And so let's take a, take a look at the Bible itself, Michelle. You know, the, you have in the in the in the story in the Genesis story, the the division of time in the first day, second day, third day, and you know God creating the world in in six days and resting on the seventh, however long those days were. But the sun and the moon weren't created until the fourth day. Now, if if time is just the observing of a certain periodicity of the of, of the way the heavenly bodies move, uh, which which the ancients knew that the the way we measure time or experience time is the relative motion of one body next to another. So how did you have time before you had those heavenly bodies all together? So it seems that time itself is a creation, one of those things that God created for man before he even put man on this planet. And time, therefore, is something that, that serves man. God has no need for it. And it's, it's, it's some abstraction which, which still torments us today. Why is it that everything we know in the physical world can go in two directions? You know, any chemical reaction can proceed in, 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 in both ways if you put enough energy into it, but we can't head back into time as much as we try. It's important to us. Interesting that if we were to get all science geeky about it, that we do know that in order to have the universe as it is, something must have caused the universe and that something must have to be greater than the universe and be outside of the confines of the dimensions of this universe. Um, and so thus outside of time. So it is interesting that God in his being outside of time. And uh, if you want more on why it's God, watch on Tuesday for our SciTech Tuesdays, because we go into that deep. If you, if you look at, and, and just for the sake of argument, we'll say it's God that created this universe. You realize that God is sitting there outside of time, watching from beginning to end. And we see that uh, the Bible says that he knew us while we were still in our, um, our mother's womb, that he knows the outcomes. He, he has a, a, a general knowing. But for us, it is very linear. We, we move from here and we're going there. We can look back and reminisce and hopefully learn from the past, but we cannot revisit it. Right. And um, part of the enthusiasm about, about celebrating New Year's is, is, is the idea that we're, we recognize our mortality and that time has been lost, another year has gone by. And we have this great expectation for the future. Hey, there's a there's a possibility of a new beginning. And that's where I got to scratch my head a little bit, because that seems to me to be so darn artificial. We have predictions for the new year. What is the new year going to bring? Well, why do you think the new year is going to be any different from yesterday? We have projections at the end of March about, well, how is our life going to change? How are our lives going to change in, 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 in the beginning of April? And Where'd you pull a pole? <laughs> well, 
Well, I, you know, I'm being, I'm being a, a little bit rhetorical because I, I do think that religious people can look at it differently because since God, since there, there is a God and God did create time for us, and there's so many reasons why he may have done that, including the idea that if, if there is no way of dividing up time, then we never become conscious of our mortality. We don't realize that time is not a renewable resource. It's the one thing out there that we can't make more of and that we have to use it, we have to use it wisely. And while it may be artificial to think that just by turning another page on our desk calendar that things are going to be different, because we're man created in the image of God, Yes, we can make things different. Yes, God does give people a second chance. Yes, God does believe in repentance and hope that man repents all the time. Yes, we can change ourselves. And there also, we are at such an advantage relative to people who are not religious because people talk, my resolutions for the next year. And, you know, you, you look at some of them in the past. Uh, well, my resolution this year is going to be, this one's from the New York Times a couple of decades ago, to wear more comfortable underwear. Uh, hey, listen, if that's, if that's what's important start to you. small, people. If you're going to do it, start small. <laughs> but even there, just resolving to do things seldom helps, seldom does anything. It's like people saying, Oh, gee, is that what the scale told me this morning? I am going to lose 15 pounds in the next six months and not have a clue about how you're going to do it. How are you going to change your behavior? How are you going to avoid the eating the things that you know you are eating in excess or the wrong things or not getting enough exercise? If you, if you are religious, then you look to the Bible and see what kind of things do I have to do to make meaningful change. Now, to me, Here's the most serious because we're we're talking about not just not my own under my own power, but with an infusion of of faith and and God's assistance. Because when we think about it, if you want to know an interesting little tidbit, a little fact, 80% of resolutions fail within the first month, 80%, 95% of resolutions ultimately fail. So you might make it through that first month, but by the next year, you're making that resolution all over again, because only 5% of the resolutions that are going to be made in just a couple of days are going to succeed. So when we look at the new year, Rabbi, we realize that uh, it is a chance to look back. We look forward, but without that God story uh, and a, a sense of does God have a purpose for me? We are almost, if we look at these statistics, doomed to a little bit of failure. So it would seem that with the infusion of that God story, that new year takes on a whole new meaning. Uh, yes, indeed. But like is true with so many things in life, we can't put it all on God's shoulders. He asks us to make the first move ourselves. So it may be a partnership. Partnership for sure. Uh, not that, that, that we can ever guarantee anything that we're going to do, but we are not allowed by God to live a life of quietism and say, listen, God, you can do anything. So I'm going to sit in my seat and hope that you are going to bring me my next million dollars and just dump it in my lap. Uh, he could do that, but that's not the way he, the, he, he uh, arranged the world. To me, the most important example is that of the story in Genesis of the binding of Isaac by Abraham. Here you have a single man making the single most important uh, sacrifice 
that is recorded in Hebrew scripture of man being asked at an old age to give up the thing that he mattered most to him, and he does so without batting an eyelash. The man who argued with God about everything else, including destroying the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, when it came for God asking him to do something, he offered no excuses. He didn't beg. He didn't plead. He said, if that's God's will, I'm going to do it. And he makes it to the point where he takes the knife and he's ready to do it. And an angel says, no way. I didn't really mean it. Don't do it. And what is Abraham's reaction at that point? You figure, like, if it were me, I'd just, you know, like, get down on my hands and knees and say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. Not Abraham. He says, wait, something's wrong here. I was ready to do a, I was ready to bring an offering, and, and, and it's not going to be my son. I have to substitute something else. And he finds that that ram that's caught in the thicket. What's going on there? Why did a person who really showed himself ready to make the most important sacrifice that Hebrew scripture talks about. Why did he say, oh, no, I can't leave here until I find something else. If it's not going to be my son, I'm going to find something else. And God had to present that ram caught in the bush so he wouldn't, you know, he'd have something to give. What is that all about? And I think that the answer is very, very simple. The easiest thing to vanish into thin air is, is, is motivation, inspiration. Inspiration vanishes into thin air unless you do something concrete. Abraham knew that he had risen to a level of closeness to God, of love of God, but it would vanish unless he was able to do something to implement it, to turn it into action, because we are creatures of doing, not only of faith. We make our faith concrete by doing things. So any resolution about the future is just not going to work unless it's married to some concrete step that you right from day one. It can be a small step, but the resolution is not going to work unless you find some way. Yes, I'm not happy with this characteristic of myself or this part of myself. It's not enough to say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm really motivated, God. Yeah, you are motivated, but turn it into a plan of action. You have to take that energy, that spiritual energy, and join it with something that you do. That beginning of that intrigues me because we have this uh, idea and maybe the magic, the enticement of a new year comes with this idea of turning over a new leaf. It's a new year. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new uh, to coin a scripture from the New Testament. Uh, Rabbi, the idea is reminiscent to me of the year of Jubilee, where every seven years there's this year of Jubilee, debts are forgiven, uh, everything is just brand new again, it's, it's a new beginning. That is something we are enchanted by, I would say. It's one of the, to me, the draws of New Year's Eve and a new year. It's the old things passing away. It's that there is a chance to turn over a new leaf. Maybe, in a way, it's reminiscent, maybe reminiscent of the desire to have repentance and renewal. Because that's really what the God story is all about, wouldn't you say? Sure. And I think your example is, is perfect, the, the Jubilee year. Um, it, it's not so much that God says, hey, it's time for a global reset, which is what people thought that COVID was. <laughs> and it's not going to be too much of a global reset, is it? But what Jubilee what Yovel in Hebrew, the Jubilee year, says is that all things return to God. 
that you don't have ownership of this world. You have a limited lease, and the lease is conditional, and that you realize that everything returns, including human life. You're not here forever, and that there are conditions for you being here. God has expectations. God is a successful CFO, chief financial officer. If he makes an investment, he expects a return. It's not enough to be able to come to the board meeting once a year and say, you know what? I didn't squander any of that money, and it has exactly the same amount as you put up at the beginning of the year. And he's going to say, ah. Oh, that's not what I put you here for. I want to see, did you give me a 25% return on the investment? That's what you're here for. You're here for a job. You're here for a mission. It sounds onerous. It sounds weighty, but it is so exhilarating to realize that no matter who you are, you have a purpose, and it's unlike the purpose of any other individual. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make carbon copies. And that, yes, he provides opportunities for us, knowing that we're human beings, to fail, but to pick ourselves up and begin again. Not just because it's a new calendar day. It's because we live in partnership with God, and God allows that to happen. This is so remarkably different. That's you know how I began this program. We, we are of two different faiths, and we know that there that are differences. But, but this commonality, one of so many, that we can experience New Year in a different way because we are religious and we are God-centered, because the God story is so important in our lives, allows us to look at a new year really with expectation, be not because we wish it to be so, but because God says it is so. And we look at a new year. We look at a new beginning because of that God story that is written, I would say, on all of our hearts. Whether you are a believer as you're watching, listening, or reading or not, it's as though we are created with this God-shaped hole in our hearts and we yearn to fill it we find all kinds of ways to fill it or to try to fill it uh, to, to distract us to maybe anesthetize uh, the ache of that emptiness but when it all comes down here we are saying goodbye to 2021 and I know there's a lot of people out there that are saying good riddance 2021 see you later <laughs> thank you goodbye but as we look at a new year I would reiterate that it is written as the God story to seek that new, that renewal, to seek something new. So as we embark on a new year and we look at all the ways people celebrate the most celebrated holiday. Not everybody celebrates Christmas. I know I've heard word that uh, Santa missed your house entirely, Rabbi. <laughs> the whole neighborhood. It's just uncanny. <laughs> Not everybody celebrates Valentine's Day. Not everybody celebrates the 4th of July. Not everybody celebrates Thanksgiving uh, or Halloween or All Hallows Eve or Day of the Dead. But every single uh, people group on our planet celebrate New Year's. And the new, and whether it's a different time of year, a uh, different month of the year, as we mentioned earlier in the program, Rabbi. And I think uh, as we look at each people group, each society, whether it's eating lentils or choking down grapes, there is still that commonality of renewal. And I do believe that because we could be different colors, different, different religions, different societies, we are still created in the image of God and created with that God-shaped whole that desires that renewal. So I think what you're saying, Michelle, is that we're so many 
parts of civilization look to the idea of a new year with a sense of hope and possibility. To us, it's not hope and possibility. It's the guarantee that we're able to make changes. The idea that God does allow multiple beginnings. That's not something we have. We can hope for, but we can expect if we turned it into reality. We can expect it. We can guarantee it. We can take it to the bank because what God, what God says is going to happen is not a vague possibility of a better world and a better time in the next 12 months. It's always a guarantee. We can make our lives meaningful. We can bring meaning into every day. One, one other thing I just like to throw in is that I think for us, the experience is different in yet another way. To many people, it's like you, like you dramatically said before, I'm glad 2021 is over and now we can turn over a new leaf and start a new kind of existence. It's like the idea that the, the, what happened is gone and now we can live for the, for the next moment. And that is a way where I think religious people differ from everybody else. Many people, maybe a majority of people on the, on the face of the earth, live in the moment for the moment. Sure, part of that, because we're human, is also planning for the future. The planning, the hope, the expectation is also part of the present. But religious people don't live just in the moment. We have the ability, the need to connect with both the past, to see ourselves as the continuation of something in the past, to relate to that past. We connect with it not just as a useful or interesting anecdote about, well, I'm one-tenth this nationality, three-tenths that nationality, and therefore I'm going to pick up certain customs. There's a continuity of purpose that we share with the past while also being committed to a future. This is such a terrible time to look at the future because there's so much gloom and despair about where the world is and we don't think that things are going to get better. But that's where religious people are different. We can relate to things that happened in the past, to the greats of the past, to what they brought into existence, and to the certainty of the better world that God says, that's my design. That's the fabric of creation. There will be a future. And you or your children or grandchildren or those you've touched in this life will bring that closer. And the time will come when God indeed will be king over the entire earth. And there it is. There is real hope. It's not about I'm going into 2021 and I'm going to impose my thoughts and my ideas and my politics and my pronouns on everybody because that's going to make a better world. No, what it really is, and this is the key. God has a plan. It's his will that it runs the world. There is a hope and it's written. It's already been done, I would say, it, outside of our dimension in the heavenly realms. God has a, a, a purpose for all of us, each one of us, you watching, you're a, a magnum opus, you're a fine work of art that God has orchestrated for a purpose that fits into a greater plan. And so those of us of faith look at a new year as crazy as the world is, as doomy and gloomy with hope knowing that we fit into a master plan and this new year or a new day, a new, you can celebrate your birthday, whatever it is where you say, where you have a, a mark of time and say, you know what, right now, I want to walk in that purpose. I, I, there is something bigger. There is something greater. So as we look to 2021, um, we look to uh, Friday. <laughs> 
we can look forward to God having a plan, a master plan. And, and that's why New Year, the New Year and the New Year celebration means so much to me because it's, a, it's, it's like a microcosm of a fresh start, of looking to the past and seeing the, the great things that God has done in my life, in, in the lives of, of those who have walked before me, the miraculous in big, huge ways, and the miraculous in little, small, beautiful, meaningful ways, and know that, that God is doing those things in my world and in my life today, and I have every reason to look forward to tomorrow and to the new year, because through faith, I know that God is going to be doing glorious things in great big ways and in small, beautiful, significant ways in each one of our lives. Michelle, that was more powerful than the best eggnog I've tasted. <laughs> you haven't tasted my eggnog yet. I <laughs> promise you a glass. <laughs> With kosher ingredients only. Only, of course. Only, of course. Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein is the Director of Interfaith Affairs at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. He is a brilliant writer, and I love putting on our page links to some of your articles, some of your recent writings. Uh, one of the things that I am most blessed by, by our rabbi, is the out-of-the-box thinking and things that are everyday items. And I think that's one thing you're very gifted in and bless us with. Everyday items or every year items like New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, uh, looking at a fresh perspective and bringing in the God story. Rabbi, thank you so much. And may I wish you a wonderful 2022 full of God's presence and blessings. Thank you to you and all of our listeners. Happy New Year. More news and views at mymichellelive.com.